Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. This is episode number 49. I will be your host. My name is Delton, and with me today is my lovely wife and yellow player, as usual, Haley. Ah, uh, I'm a lovely and yellow player. Only because you're going to be gone this weekend. Oh, I'm only lovely because absence makes the heart grow fonder? Yes. Bye. That's exactly what it is. Welcome to the Moth House Games Podcast. We are a podcast all about tabletop games, card games, role-playing games, board games, that sort of stuff. And talking with your hands and knocking over beer. Talking with our hands is definitely part of our uh, routine, regimen, MO, whatever you want to say. We use our hands a lot. Our vibe. I use my hands the more I drink, which is a problem. <laughs> which is how the beer ends up on the floor. Yes, on the rug, as it has in past episodes. Speaking of beer, we're going to dive right into the first one and not dilly-dally longer than we should. This is This Land Lager. It is a Hellas Lager by Marshall Brewing Company, which is out of Tulsa. Hella Lager. Thank you. 4.8% alcohol by volume in a little can. I don't see any descriptor of, like, the type of beer. I mean, it's a lager. Uh, in terms of like hops or anything like that. So I'm going to give it the gentle tip upside down and flip back over to mix around any fogginess. Called a tip and flip. A tip and flip? A tip and flip. Is that the scientific term? Yes, clinical term. So while Delton is pouring his beer, we've had some adventures over the last week. So as Delton said, I am going out of town tomorrow. I am going to be speaking at the Recovering from Religion Foundation's annual retreat. I will be speaking on overcoming the fear of hell which is going to be an adventure. I'm really, really nervous. I speak in front of people all the time. Like I've done trainings for other therapists and I've been on other podcasts. Like I'm not really nervous about speaking, but it's something about me being flown out to go speak that is la- giving me this like extra layer of you got to do good. Well, you're going to do fine, but it is cool that they're paying for your stay. They're paying for your flight. You're going to have food provided along with the rest of the people. Vegan food. In Asheville, North Carolina. I think it's going to be a good time. I'm very excited. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And hopefully I can be an asset to the organization for three days. Woo! If you don't remember, Haley is presenting on Overcoming the Fear of Hell. And this is the Recovering from Religion Foundation, since Haley does counsel uh, secularly. I just said all of that. Did you? Yep. Oh, I missed it. (laughs) That's okay. So (laughs) Delton... I've had a problem recently. (laughs) Especially the past couple days. I think I've just been tired. And then today, I think I just got stressed out by friggin' social situations that I don't like, I guess you could say. And uh, Shoe shopping. So, <laughs> before we taste the beer, uh, I am trying to, since if you've followed us on social media at Gen Con, I posted my picture where I took a picture in Gen Con in 2017, 2018, 2019 of me after going vegan. I've lost weight. We've been working out. Lost 75 pounds of weight. All that good stuff. And I want to try to get into running a little or at least walking since it's starting to turn to fall here in Oklahoma. We've got probably, what, another month maybe of like summer weather, but it's already starting to cool slightly. It's in the lower 90s now. Hell yeah, brother. So I want to get into running or at least just walking. So I wanted to get a nice pair of shoes because I don't have the greatest knees in the world, and I don't want to just go out on some cheap shoes and risk actually hurting myself. So I went to go shoe shopping today at Dick's Sporting Goods and look at some of these nice running shoes. Long story short, they don't have boxes out where you can just try your shoes on. You have to ask people, so I left. That was the, that's the story. And for me, that is, uh, I felt just upset about it. You know, oh, I'm sorry, honey, but it's fine. I'll I wanted a social buffer next time. I wanted to try on shoes, but I didn't want to bug people to try them on. And then the little foot scale thing said my foot size was smaller. So I was like, okay, well, shit, do I try on the normal size, which is a 12? Or do I go to the 11 that it's suggesting? But if I do that, I have to have them bring like two shoes out. And then I also have to see if my foot's still wide size or not. So I just didn't know what to do. This is why Delton and I balance each other out because... Yes. If I can't find something within two and a half seconds of walking in the store, I'm like, excuse me, ma'am, donde está the bathroom? And if I can't find something within two seconds, we're going to be there another hour until Haley finally asks somebody. Once I can no longer convince her not to ask somebody. Yeah, so Delton's had a hard day. So yep. when Delton has a hard day, sometimes whenever he is performing tasks like pouring a beer, 
He gets focused and he can't hear anything that I'm saying. Yay. I had a whole conversation with him when he got home. Whole conversation about having to pack and what I did today. And then I asked him a question. He looked up and said, what? And I asked the question again. He goes, I don't follow. And so I had to repeat the entire thing again because he was responding as I was talking. It's just Belton kind of clocked out sometimes. Yeah, I super clocked out, which is terrible. But uh, yeah, it happens. That's my day. So now we drink. Smell we the beer. even more. We can. Smell the beer. Give it a whiff. What's it smell? Just normal, nice lagery? It smells like agave nectar. I don't get the agave nectar. It almost has a wheat beer element of the smell. It's like Honey Nut Cheerios. I don't see that either. Well, it's like the, the agave, the sweet, and the, and the wheat. You just don't have a refined <laughs> palate like I do. Yeah, you, I've and, been your to oaky, Europe. you and your oaky after. I've, <laughs> I've, I've been to Europe. <laughs> I've been to Europe. I've got a palate now, bitch. <laughs> so taste it. Give it a taste. Oaky afterbirth. It's not as carbonated as I expected it to be. It's pretty smooth, which is nice. It stays smooth the whole time. It's smooth, but it tastes filling. It has a thick taste, almost, like a... Yeah. It lingers in the mouth a little bit. It kind of has that, like, uh, not foamy, but heaviness to it. Uh, but it does kind of have that filling where it's not watered down, which is nice. You know what I mean? It doesn't taste thin. Yeah, because most lagers you taste are watered down because it's the cheap beer. Yeah, that's exactly... I mean, yeah. But yeah, that's not bad. So what else we've been up to, Delty Poo? Oh, where did you get to go on Saturday? I got to go to hell. <laughs> Otherwise known as a uh, country western music concert for Alan Jackson. Essentially, it is my hell. But what are you going to do? Uh, it was, if you remember it all, if you've been listening or heard some of our episodes back earlier this year, in April, Alan Jackson was coming through. And it was for mom's, Haley's mom's birthday. We got tickets for everybody. And he ended up canceling because he got sick. Well, he finally came back. And so we got to go see him. And Delton had a great time. He enjoyed sitting next to me as I knew all the words to every song. It was great and wonderful and a very immersive experience. I kept looking at the set list on my phone and just counting down until the end. Such a jerk. <laughs> Not my style of music at all. <laughs> but so, at least you went to it, and I'm very happy that you did. I sucked it up and cried like a baby before and after, <laughs> but I sucked it up during. But you, you made it through, and you got french fries out of it. Fresh french fries. I made them on the spot. And we also got to see Riley and the littlest baby Lakin. We did. Lakin's going to get a cat. She has a cat. Which is exciting, and its name is amazing. So it's a white cat, and they were going to name it Snowflake. And so Riley tells Lakin, I guess, to, that they're naming it Snowflake. And what does Lakin call it? Snow Snake. She says Snow Snake. And it's the cutest thing. So now she has her little white kitten named Snow Snake that it, follows her around. It's perfect. She'll, get, she'll go, uh, come on, sugar. Come on, Snow Snake. Follow me. And just walk down the hallway. Because I love that she calls bug. it sugar. Like she's a 90 year old lady. Like, <laughs> come on, sugar. Over come on, here. sugar. Would you like a hard candy? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And then Zach and Sarah had their baby. Congratulations, Zach and Sarah. Congrats, Zach and Sarah, for the relatively easy birth by the sounds of it, which is great. I, I don't know if it was easy. I think it was just quick. It was just quick. There I guess that's the story good... behind that. That's I'm not true. gonna share that on here, but That's fine. Ugh. It was quick and have, the baby's healthy. Control smoothie. Yeah. <laughs> the baby is healthy. Sarah is healthy. Everyone's doing great. So we couldn't yes. have asked for more from that. It was a really good couple of weeks. It has been a good couple of weeks. Not as much game playing as we want because life's been busy. However, we got to play some games recently, which is where we're going now. Dun, da, da. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's, it's a game. The game for this episode is the notorious and very hyped Wingspan. I say notorious because it's been hard to get a hold of for a lot of people. It is. It's elusive. It is elusive. That's a good one. <laughs> so Wingspan is the newest game from Stonemeyer Games. It is designed by Elizabeth Hargrave. It's her first game, which is mind-blowing, but awesome. The she illustrations. Did a very good job. She did. The illustrations of the birds, I know, is Natalia Rojas. There's also Anna Maria Martinez Jaramillo and Beth Sobel. 
There are also some credits on the back that I think are interesting, and I'm going to go ahead and say them because I think people might be interested in this. The bird information, so each card in this game has a bird on it. There's like 170-some different birds, and each bird has a little snippet of info that's actually about that bird. And here's the thing. There are 170 different birds, not like six sparrows, ten ducks. No, every single card is a different bird, like a horned owl or a mallard duck or a ran out of birds. Yeah, we don't know many, <laughs> many birds. It's like the, uh, what is it? There's the crow, standard crow. And then there's the, is it the red hooded crow that's got red on its head? And then there's the Orioles and there's orange ones and there's different colors, all that good stuff. Uh, but on the back, the bird information comes from the All About Birds website by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is allaboutbirds.org. <laughs> Cornell. The <laughs> he went to Cornell. The Audubon Guide to North American Birds, which is audubon.org, that's A-U-D-U-B-O-N slash bird guide, and the Sibley Field Guides to Birds of Eastern North America and Western North America by David Allen Sibley. So those are the resources there. So if you're into bird watching or birding, I think it's called, or ornithology, those are some resources which are cool. And the bird on the cover is Oklahoma State Bird. I forgot I do know that bird. Yep, scissor tail fly, fly catcher. Yeah, it's pretty neat to have that on the cover for us. Uh, the This is crazy. The Dice Tower was made by Tower Rex, which is towerrex.com. The photogenic sources for the birds come from Glenn Bartley, Alan Murphy, Roman T. Bruca, Robin Palmer, sorry, Rob Palmer, and Peter Green. The prints of the birds and other illustrations can be found at nataliarojasart.com and annamartinez.com. And the typeface is Cardinio Modern, designed by Nils Cordes at nilscordes.com. That's a lot of credits, but I really liked they laid out the typeface, where the birds came from, all the artist stuff. So you can go look it up and actually see the real birds yourself and learn about them. Yes, I just thought it was some really cool information to throw out there uh, that they put on the game. But we are talking about Wingspan. So Wingspan is a engine building game and sort of a tableau building game as well. The way the game is going to function is on your turn, you have these little cubes. You will put a cube in one of three rows. The cube moves from the right most open spot to the left, sometimes going over cards that you've played to your tableau, activating different abilities, and then your turn's over, goes to the next person. On your turn, you can do one of four things. You can either play a new bird down, paying its food cost and its egg cost, or you can activate the top row, which will get you food and activate birds. This activate the middle row, which will lay eggs that you put on birds for different things and activate birds in that middle row, or you can put a cube on the bottom row, which activates drawing cards and any birds in that row. Once you learn the game, it's very simple to get through. There are few questions we have here or there, but once you get those down, you're done. So it's a pretty simple game to grasp. And Jamie Stegmeyer has answered every question that we ever had about the game on his profile. At some point, yes, either BGG or on the Wingspan game group on Facebook, things like that. So that's very helpful. But essentially in the game, you're going to have these bird cards you place in your tableau. So, for example, I said you have cubes. Uh, in the beginning of the game, you have eight cubes. The game runs over four rounds. Each of those rounds consists of however many turns equal to the number of cubes you have. So, in the first round, you have eight turns. So you will take a cube and place it on an empty spot in one of the three rows on your tableau. What it is, is the top row is always going to allow you to get food from the bird feeder, which is the dice tower and some dice in it. The more birds you have in that row, the more food you'll be able to take every time you activate that row, and then you activate the birds on it. So you'll take the top row for food, middle row for eggs, bottom row for cards, but you can also play a bird into those rows. Some birds have abilities to activate when they interplay. Most birds are going to have an ability that activates if you turn on or activate that row. I hope this makes sense. This game's weird to describe for me for some reason. No, it makes sense. I'm following you, but I've played it before. That's also true. So on these bird cards, you're going to have several pieces of information. I think the coolest part is they actually use this information based off of the birds themselves. It's not just made up. Yeah, so if you have a bird that is a predator, it will collect birds behind it that have a smaller wingspan than they are, which basically means that it ate that bird. Yeah, you'll tuck it underneath the card so like it ate it. And then the, like the horned owl, you can roll the die, and if there are any mice that pop up, that bird eats the mice, and you collect the mice on that card, and you get points for every mouse that it eats. 
So this is a cool mechanic to the game. So each bird card you play in your tableau is worth points. I always like that. That's a nice, simple, easy thing. I feel like a ton of tableau games do that. But something this one does that I haven't ran across yet is that there are three different ways to get points at the end of the game on top of your birds and your bonus objectives. Everybody has an objective and has a chance to get more throughout the game. Some of those cards, like Haley said, a predatory bird, allows you most of the time to tuck cards behind it if it's a small enough wingspan. The cards do list each bird's average wingspan. So the great horned owl that I had this game, if you draw from the top of the deck and the wingspan is less than 100 centimeters, it tucks underneath the great horned owl. Now that card is worth one point at the end of the game. My turkey vulture. If Delton were to execute successfully one of his predatory acts, so like his great horned owl were to eat a rat, then my turkey vulture would also get a rat. Yes, which is awesome because that's points for Haley. And it's carnage. I'm nom 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 nom. I'm a turkey vulture. So some birds have the ability, like Haley's, to put tokens, food tokens, there are five different food tokens in the game, on top of them. So I had a bird. Every time it comes across, you just take a wheat token and put it on that bird. That is now worth one point at the end of the game. It's essentially showing that that bird is storing food up for, I guess, kind of like the winter is how I treat it in my brain. Yeah. Those are now worth points. And then eggs that you get to put on cards are worth one point at the end of the game. So I enjoy that even though you're building these engines of doing all this crazy stuff to draw new cards and put birds down and do all this, all this other stuff actually is worth points and everybody can kind of diversify in that. Haley's strategy, the game we played tonight, was I'm just going to get a shit ton of eggs out on the board and, and just make an omelet. A third of my egg or a third of my points were from eggs. It really was. It was a ton. But I had a bunch of points from birds storing food and then one point from my great horned owl eating a little bird. Sadly, all the other ones he tried to eat were too big and they got discarded. Yeah. Which was sad, but it's cool. But that's something I like is you can, even though everyone's doing essentially the same thing, putting birds down, activating these rows, the engines you build and make differ from person to person so much, which ends up kind of determining your strategy. So you start the game with a hand of five cards and you get one of each five food tokens. For every card you keep, you must discard a food token. So if you have a hand of five, I kept two. I only discarded two food tokens, so I started with three food. So those starting hand of cards do kind of dictate your initial beginning because there's only ever three face-up birds to buy or draw during the turn, or you can draw from the top of the deck. So there is going to be that random chance in this game of if I don't draw what I need, I may not be able to actually do this the way I fully want to or the most um, efficient engine. Because here's the thing. As the game goes on, you have fewer turns per round because you start off with eight cubes, right? Yeah, eight cubes. You start off with eight cubes. And so you have eight turns in a round. But after at the end of each round, one of those cubes is used to keep points. And so by the last round, you only have five turns. It's like a roll of toilet paper. The longer you go, the faster it goes. It, yeah, it's the longer you use it, the quicker it goes, is how I like to describe yeah. it. Yeah. But it is, and that honestly is probably like my favorite thing with this game, which is such a dumb thing to be the favorite. But you start with eight cubes. You have eight turns. After that, uh, each of the four rounds has like a bonus. At the end of that round, you get a bonus depending on how many of something you completed. So, for example, in ours, uh, we did the non-competitive side, which means you can get up to five points for each thing and everyone gets their own points. The competitive side, the person who has the most gets the most points, second most gets the second most points. We figured with two players, non-competitive is probably best. And so what it is, is at the end of that round, you each place one of your cubes on how many points you get on that little bonus board. And then now the next round, you've only got seven actions. And as Haley said, you go down to six and you go down to five for the last one. And... The goals for each round will change per game. So this time we had the very first one was birds on this type of nest. The next one was eggs on this type of nest. The next one was eggs on a different kind of nest. And the last one was water birds. So you got points based on how many of those critters or how many of those eggs that you had. Yeah, so it's neat because there's multiple tiles and those tiles are double-sided. So you just kind of randomly pick, which means that will change every game. But the reason I love the structure of using your like action tokens, essentially, those cubes, to mark those points and lose actions through the game, most engine building games, or most games, you st either have the same amount of turns the whole game, or you gain turns as the game goes on. The reason I really love 
the fact that you lose turns as this game goes on is because it keeps the time it takes for a round relatively equal. On the first round, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this and play a bird. I'll do this and activate this row. I'll do this and do this. I'll play another bird. I'll do this to get some food. I'll put some eggs out. You do eight things. Well, the next time, you're now doing seven, but the rows you activate now have more things going on. So it kind of counteracts missing that by having more stuff happening. That's a good point. So it keeps the time structure constantly lowering, but it also puts you in crunch gear real fast. Yes. Because you have eight. You're like, I can do whatever I want. I get eight actions around. This isn't too bad. And then you get seven. And you're like, I only get one less. That's not horrible. But then you hit six, and you're like, oh, shit, this is getting tough. And then the last time we only have five, you're like that old woman in the Beauty and the Beast that, I need eggs! <laughs> you're just freaking out. Just like freaking I don't out. I, I need eggs! I really was. My la- I was the very last turn. I guess I wasn't. You were, was I the last player to go? I was. I was first player. You were last player. But that last turn on the last round, I had to calculate each move. If I play this bird, I get two points, but I use two eggs to do it, so I technically only net one point. But if I do this... I net one point here, maybe, but no other points. But if I do this, I get three points and some extra food, and hopefully those three points is enough. So I had to math it out. But I love that you lose those turns. I don't know what it is about it, but every time it happens, I'm like, this was a smart design. I like this a lot. It doesn't make the game feel like it drags at the end, and waiting on someone to go through an engine three or four times at the end doesn't feel bad when that four to five max isn't seven to eight. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and all in all, this is a very engaging game. You're very engaged at the beginning because you're trying to lay your strategy out, and at the very end, you're engaged pretty late because you're like, oh, shit, I don't have long I don't have long before the game's over. That's true. I really think that Elizabeth Hargrave did a wonderful job in the design. It's a very engaging game, and it's very fun. I really love how the theme interacts with the play as well. Just like Delton said, that certain birds will have certain abilities that really match with what that bird really is. And all in all, it's a solid game. It's easy to learn. It's easy to play, and it's really fun. It's really fun. And, I mean, top-notch components. It's Stonemeyer. Their components are always good. Uh, the bird cards, the quality of the rule books, the dice tower, the storage components, everything in the game has been really great, which is awesome. We've liked it a lot. Uh, I want to introduce some more people to it, but even Brian played this and said, it's really good. Um, I always love finding games that Brian really enjoys because he likes a lot of games. And because... He and Allison are like the two friends that play with us all the time. That's also true. So when Allison likes <laughs> no something or Brian. <laughs> no offense to Zach is there. They moved away. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, we have to show Allison this one. I think she'll like it. But Brian and Jessica really enjoyed the game. And Brian thought it was very clever. So that's something we can bust out and play easily. And since all three of us have played it, bringing more people is not a problem. So that's going to be great. Uh, one other thing I like about it is most engine building games are very, very, very non-interactive. The only ones I can think of is like we talked about gizmos where there's only six uh, marbles you see. And if you take one somebody wants and it's like the only blue one out there and you take it, that kind of hurts them. I think what I like about Wingspan so much is pretty much all of the interaction between players. It's very minimal, but all of it is positive for the most part. If you take the one bird someone's wanting, I guess you could see that as negative. Or if they reset the bird feeder to different food. But even that then, could be. even then, that's not bad. It's not going to kill you. But what I love is when the cards interact with other players, it's always a positive thing. So, like your vulture, when my horned owl successfully ate another bird, your vulture got food. I got leftovers. Which makes sense. It's a carrion bird, right? Did you ever tell you my vulture story? Tell me in a second. Okay. So I don't forget this. Uh, what I like about that, though, is you received a benefit. I did not receive a penalty, right? Yes. Whenever I had the one bird that when it gets there, uh, we all get to take food from the bird feeder. I get to choose the order. Perfect. If I want to let you take the food, then I can take mine when, I, when the bird feeder resets or when I can reset it. I get the biggest benefit of having the most food choice. Uh, for those who haven't played the game, the bird feeder has five dice. If at any time it's out of dice or all of the dice, including just one, show only one type of food, they can be re-rolled. So if there's two dice in the tray and they're different, I can have Haley choose food first with that card. She takes one. Then I can re-roll all the dice in the bird feeder to take my choice. But I really like the interaction of Haley getting something from that. So most of the cards are benefiting the other players as well, or they benefit you for what the other players do, but you're not going to find something harming the other players taking things from them so far from what I've seen. Uh, And I really enjoy that about it. So as Haley said, it's been a great game, easy to play, 
easy to learn. It's great components. We've really enjoyed the game a lot. And uh, I'm very glad I finally got my hands on it. So I think I think Elizabeth knocked this one out of the park. I'm very glad I had her and Natalia sign that little f- first player token at Gen Con. I'm very excited to have that privilege. So that's pretty cool. And technically, you bought this game for me, so it's my game. Uh, I did buy it mostly for you because I hadn't played it when I bought it, I think. I'm taking it with me on my trip. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that is Wingspan from Stonemeyer Games. Uh, there's a lot more detail in terms of how it plays. I know it's kind of weird to describe through podcasts, but look up the Watch It Played video. It is an amazing video to help you get a grasp on it. I highly recommend, if it, you're not sure about it, pick it up and play it at a cafe. It's really, really good. So one of the things that Wingspan does is, as I said, not only do you build an engine, but you're actually building out a tableau, which is perfect for our topic. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. Now let's pop some tableau and pour another beer. (sighs) That was really really bad. You marry this. If you try and leave this, I'm taking Wingspan with me. Don't do it! Because it's mine! Don't do it, it's in the will. That doesn't make any sense now that I think of it. <laughs> a will for what, <laughs> well, the cats? For the cats, yeah. So we do have What a... is this, a will for cats? We do need to get that solidified. Basically, if we die, our friend Amy gets all of our money, but she also takes care of the cats. So, thank you, Amy. She didn't get the money, but she gets yeah, the cats. Yeah, she does. Remember, she gets our retirement so she can take care of the cats. I did not remember that. <laughs> we talked about this. It was the night that I accidentally gave the work telephone number as my social security number. Oh, that makes sense. So, Vulture Story. Go for it. Vulture Story. All right. So, back in the day, this is like late 90s, early 2000s, uh, we would take a lot of school and church and 4-H and Girl Scout trips to Quartz Mountain. And there is this... I don't know what she is, if she's a game warden or if she's just a park manager, but she was always there. And she lost her foot in a motorcycle accident in Kenya in like the 70s. And she was like this badass chick who just rode a motorcycle everywhere. And she was probably like 50 back in 1998. But every time we went out to Quartz Mountain State Park for any kind of adventure, whether that be school, Girl Scouts, 4-H, whatever, she was always there and always had lots of fun things to teach us. Like, she was the one who taught me how to hypnotize chickens. And she was also the one who showed us that if you lay on the mountaintop uh, where there's a little clearing of the trees and you lay there still, the buzzards will start swooping down at you. That's terrifying. Yeah, they'll start circling above you. You lay there and they'll start circling above you. And then they'll get, it's like a little slowest tornado in the world. Like, they'll slowly start drifting down and before you know it they're swooping right over you and then you scream when you run well yeah because pretty soon they're just gonna stop and dig in yeah they are (laughs) they're trying to figure out if you're dead or not basically and i was alive that's really interesting yeah i would never do that i don't know if she's still there i need to figure that out it's been forever she She probably probably got eaten by a vulture i mean i wouldn't (laughs) doubt it because what do we have turkey buzzards is what we call them but they're turkey vultures yeah turkey vultures that's just crazy yeah that's That's my that's my story that's a good one i haven't heard that before actually oh really yeah. Ah, not full of surprises. Boom, all the time. Hypnotizing <laughs> chickens and getting attacked by vultures. So the next beer for this episode is La Gitana, which is a cerveza craft lager with lime and mint. Cerveza, if you're unaware, is the Spanish word for beer. We have another language lesson by Delton. Language lesson by me. It is uh, Spanish, not Mexican. I'm used to cerveza being considered it's Mexican beer, and we have cerveza. All the companies we have produce a quote-unquote Mexican beer. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Modelo and Tecati and Dos Equis is all a Mexican lager. And Corona. So, and Corona. So that's what I think in my head when I hear cerveza. I think, that's Mexican for beer. But what does that's Corona just, mean? I don't know. Guess. I don't know. Guess. Belt I, language abilities activate. I really don't know. Crayon. <laughs> it means red baton. No, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you piece of shit. I believe it means crowd. You're sleeping on the couch. <laughs> I'm not crown. sleeping at all because I'm leaving at like three in the morning. That's bitch. true, but <laughs> that that makes sense uh, that it would mean crown, not crayon, but crayon. I was close. <laughs> depending are. depending on <laughs> depending on how you say crayon, if you call it a crown, then I'm I'm gonna call that a win for me. 
Oh, man. So this is a beer. It is a craft lager with <laughs> lime and mint from Twisted Spike Brewing Co. in Oklahoma City. This says, brewed and canned by Twisted Spike, Spike Brewing Co. Craft lager with lime and mint. La Gitana stands for the gypsy. There you go. Uh, free-spirited and will travel with you everywhere. Take it to the lake, beach, and the patio. Perfect with tacos, fajitas, and pizza. And podcasts. Alcohol, thank you, is 4.4%. IBU is 25. <laughs> Crowns. <laughs> Crown. I always used to make fun of people who said it like that because it's like, no, it's a crayon. And who knows how it's supposed to be pronounced, crowns. but it's definitely not crowns. <laughs> Whoa, I can Ooh, smell Jesus. the lime in this. Gosh, Woo! darn it. It's super, super lime heavy. It almost smells like a bar of soap. That was not the flavor I was expecting. It's expecting. bubble gum. It is bubble gum. It's like a mint. It's a mint bubble gum. Mint bubble gum with some beer on the back, and I'm not impressed. What the hell am I drinking? I, uh, the mint is weird. The mint is really weird. It's like you're drinking a beer after you've been chewing gum. Oh, oh. <laughs> Your pupils just dilated like this, 18 inches. This is what I imagine it tastes like to drink a beer when you have wintergreen snuff in. Oh, God. <laughs> this is what your father experiences on the daily. Oh, uh, if you are unaware, snuff is... Like it's, Copenhagen. It's, it's not chewing tobacco, because chewing tobacco is actually something you chew, but I don't know if right. they make chewing tobacco anymore. But it's the tobacco in a can that you poke in your lip, and as your mouth fills up with the juices, you actually have to spit it out, but you absorb the tobacco through your like mouth, which is how people get a lot of jaw cancer. It's a really big problem. But people in western Oklahoma do it all the time. They hate smoking, but they'll stick that stuff in their face. And it's, it's horrible. I've tried it when I was younger. I do not like it. But people drink beer with it in their mouth, and I've never got it, and now I get it. <laughs> See, it used to be medicine when I was a kid. Did it really? So if you would be, like, running around doing hood rat stuff with your friends, and you fell and scraped your knee, your dad or your uncle would pull a big wad out of his mouth and stick it on the, on the wound. Does the tobacco have some sort of property? I have no idea, but I didn't die. I don't either. See, Andrew at work, his son was stung by a bee, like, on the throat. And some old guy took out his dip put it uh -huh. in a paper towel and put it on the bee sting to help pull the stinger out and i was like what J just pull it out he's right there but i guess there's something i don't know i don't know but there has to be something within the tobacco plant that's like or your dad spit or the maybe it's your dad spit. you know they it's, have like that mom spit you can buy the little spray that like no. spray it on the cloth and you know because your mom would like lick a paper towel or yep. lick your finger and like dig her thumb in your eyeball to mm -hmm. get that gunk out of your eye mm -hmm. um they sell it like in a it's a little bottle now. You spray it on paper towel. It says mom spit. It's basically supposed to be like a, just a clean version of that. Not your mom's <laughs> like coffee and uh, yep. egg McMuffin in your eyeball. Yep. And so maybe dad spit has like some healing qualities, whereas mom's is just a cleanser. Who knows at this point, but that's just crazy. But I didn't die. But anyway, that's what this tasted like. It's now died off. It's easier. Now that my taste buds are more used to it, it's not as abrasive. It's still not good. This is wonky as hell. This is the wonkiest beer I've ever tried in my life. Now, here's the thing. This is the longest we've spent on a beer, I think. <laughs> here's the thing. It's not that it's terrible. It's bad, but, like, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still going to drink it. You know? It's still going to go down <laughs> into my belly and make me happy. But I'm not going to put it down, but I'm not going to buy it again. And the problem is we bought a six-pack, so now we have to drink five more. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we do is we drink a couple of we decent ones. Oh, we donate. Next we donate can it. food drive. Yes. It's a four pack of beer. Why not? It's got nutrition as much as they won't put it on the label. There's vitamins it's in this. It's got lime. There's carbs. Apparently mint. It really is very, very strange. The more that I've drank it, the more my taste buds have uh, become more accustomed, but it's still just not very not good. Not mine. Bag of, okay. Haley's face. Okay, Ugh. we need to move <laughs> past this weird, weird beer and on to the topic. The topic today is tableau building games. We enjoy tableau building games. There's something fun about playing cards in front of you, and whether the actions are immediate or something you activate later, it's fulfilling to see yourself put something together. You know what I mean? Wingspan does that. You have built habitats full of birds. And it's cool to say, look, I've got all these birds out here, and this bird's the one who eats all the other birds, and this bird over here collects all the wheat and hides it in his nest. And you can make up those kinds of stories another game that does that uh is race for the galaxy where you're building your galaxy of these cards and they're generating different resources 
and things like that. And you can have military planets. That's another one. And technologies that I feel like, you know, you build your Tableau out and it's just neat to see at the end of the game. And I think that's something that Tableau building has is you go from nothing in front of you to having this thing you've put together where you can tell a story if you want. That's why I really like PAX Premier, because as the game goes on, basically you're building your political alliances and laying them out in your tableau. Now, if you ever switch alliances, like you go from aligning with British troops to the Russians, then you lose all of those alliances and your tableau is completely wiped. You have to build it back up again. But it's a really good visual representation of the longer you're in, an area, the longer you align with a certain side, the more influence you're going to get and the more friends you're going to make. I really like how the tableau shows that. And the tableau in Pax Pamir is just uh, one part of the game, but it's still neat to have that because not only does it function in the game, but it does give you that story and it works into how you're playing and how the game develops. Haley's face after drinking a drink of this beer. Woo! Twisted Spike, I'm glad you're here, but like, uh, woo! Jeez. Damn. Yeah, it's okay. We'll try more from them later. It's my first Twisted Spike beer, so I'll have to try others. So another tableau building game in a kind of a different style would be like Arboretum, where you're placing these cards, these trees that are numbered in front of yourself and building paths between them. That's going to be something a bit different. It's essentially building a grove of trees, of different types of trees. But that's also tableau building. And I think, I think all of these are going to be tied together with just the fact that I like building things. I think you could say tableau building is very closely related to tile placement. So something like Isle of Sky, where in Isle of Sky, you're building just your own little area and putting tiles out and making it bigger. And it's going to give you new income and new goals. Hopefully you're scoring and things like that. But you're building your own, not a cumulative like section like Carcassonne or something. So I just there's something about building my own stuff and making it the way I want to make it that just feels good. It's all the fun of the deck builder without the patience needed for that card to come up. I think that's a really good way to put it, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like Alhambra, too. Alhambra, you build out your Alhambra. You try to make your roads connect, or sorry, your walls connect. There's just something about tableau building. Uh, Part of it, too, is you can see what other people are doing. You can keep an eye on how their game's going. In Wingspan, you can watch people and say, you know, I think they're doing this. I can't stop it, but it's cool to see. That's a shit ton of <laughs> eggs. <laughs> That's a lot of eggs over there, Haley. Jeez. One more that I want to talk about. I know this is kind of a shorter topic compared to some, but Imperial Settlers also does a tableau building, but it's also engine building. It's just a completely different style than Wingspan. I do really like it, and there is more negative. I would call it negative. Uh, I guess you could call it confrontational interaction in that game between players, but... You're building a tableau of your buildings that give you more functions to do more things, but at the end of the game, you look down and go, oh, look, there's a barracks, and this person's making apples, and there's something over here doing something cool, and a well. So tableau builders just, I know, I feel like we should have a much more in-depth conversation about them, but the problem is it's a mechanic, and I like that mechanic a lot. And there's not really something you could say in terms of the mechanic itself more than Your building out in front of you, it gives you stuff to look at. You're not holding a hand of cards is a big benefit for me, but you make a story with it. And when we play games, as we've talked about, we want something like that. We like Seven Wonders when you can observe your city at the end. And that's exactly what Tableau Building does. And Wingspan does it well, and so do these other games. And it's just something that I find very enjoyable. And when someone says, this is a Tableau Builder, I'm instantly like, all right, I'll check it out. Same here. So we'll move on out of the topic so we can speed this episode toward its finish and move to the question. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special, Bite Size Question. So, we have a bit of a wonky question this time. So, I'm sure most people have high school yearbooks, and your senior year, you're voted, like, most likely to succeed, most likely to become president, kindest, whatever. And so what we decided to do is Delt and I are each going to get a random designation that would be in a high school yearbook, and then we're going to choose a random bird card. We're going to make an argument to each other why our birds would win that designation. Okay, so we have selected our random birds. I had to get up and get over there, so I'm going to not put that in. But Haley, what is my designation or what is my most likely to blank? And I will then reveal my bird card and talk about it and stuff. 
Yours is most likely to become famous. Most likely to become famous. And I have the bird, the northern flicker. Now, it does have its scientific name, which is Caleptus aratus. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the little statistics on the card since they're short. Uh, it has a 51 centimeter wingspan, and they're only in North America. And it says these woodpeckers seek out ground-dwelling insects rather than pecking wood. So most woodpeckers peck holes in the tree and dig bugs out of the inside of the tree. Isn't that right? And they make their nests in the tree? That's a good question. That is a good question. I know they make their nests in holes in the trees, but still. This one also makes his nest in a hole in the tree, according to the card. They have a nest eggs of around four. Interesting. So why is your bird most likely to become famous? So my bird's a pretty woodpecker. I've got a cool-looking mohawk that's kind of red. I have the look. This bird has the look of a famous bird, you know, a la Big Bird. It's the only famous bird I know. Uh, and D from Always Sunny. What about Woody Woodpecker? Woody Woodpecker's There's another, and it's a, a wood. Woodpecker. Boom! This is Woody's long lost great 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 nephew. You're saying it's a D-list celebrity? Yes, he was a child actor, son of another famous bird, and he's famous, just not as famous as he should be. But that's why he's most likely to be famous, though, is because. He's related. I don't know. I yep. just caught the D. Reynolds part. Did you? She's a very famous <laughs> bird. She, she's another famous bird. Uh, yeah, so the Northern Flicker, which is a woodpecker, will be famous because family ties. It's really lame, but there you go. Okay, I did You, it. madam, are most likely to be a doctor. Okay. So I have the blue-winged warbler. Oh. The Vermivora cyoptera. Cool. Cyanoptera. I apologize. I don't speak Latin. The warbler especially likes to nest on the edges be- between forests and fields. Oh, that's cool. So I'm going to say that this bird was raised in a very <laughs> rural area. You turn the card around and the birds kind of squat with like a really big chest and the look on its face is just like, <laughs> it looks like he's not quacking, but <laughs> That's what that, sorry, that caught me off guard. Go ahead. So this bird looks like he was raised in a rural area. Okay, so he saw a need because, as you know, rural areas have a very short staff of medical professionals. And so he decided to go to college, and he decided to become a doctor. And look, he has a very authoritarian look about him. He looks like he's wearing a mask, and he's frowning and squawking and yelling. (laughs) He knows how to lead a team of medical professionals. (laughs) Not only a team of medical professionals in the ER. Someone comes in and they're missing a leg. This bird is like, I will tell you what to do and you will listen. It commands authority. And this bird saves lives. All right. So Plus, he's already yellow. So if any blood gets on him, you can tell. You can so tell. So he doesn't even have to wear a lab coat. There you go. All right. So if you want to look these up to see if our descriptions are accurate, I have the northern flicker. So like you're flicking somebody on the ear or something. Flick. Haley's is the what? The blue winged warbler. How do you spell warbler? W-A-R-B-L-E-R. Okay, exactly how I thought. That's fine. <laughs> and the, you said blue-winged? Correct. Cool. There you go. Those are our birds for the question. Commanding authority. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode 49 of the Malthouse Games podcast. I want to give a big, 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 big shout out to our awesome Patreon backers, Alan, Allison, Jesse, and Catherine. You four are amazing and help us so much keep upgrading our equipment and things like that. If you want to be like them and get shouted out on the podcast or placed at the end of our videos or even just tweeted at, make sure to go to patreon.com slash Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. If you want to hit us up on all social media and give us a nice, you know, sweet follow it is at Malthouse Games again. You can find me personally at Delton Brack, D E L T O N B R A C K. And you can find Haley at S Q U I R R E L Y G E E K. That is at Squirrely Geek. If you have any questions for us, or a question you want us to answer on the show, a topic you want us to talk about on the show, or a game for us to look at, you can definitely send us an email, contact at malthousegames.com. Now, I don't check that email all the time only because it doesn't notify me immediately when I get an email through my phone, but I try to check it at least once every week or two. So I might be a little slow getting back to you, but I will at some point. A little hokey pokey. A little pokey. Our next episode will be the episode that releases during Token Con weekend. We are going to try to have that episode out 
but after we've been through some of Token Con. So hopefully we can have a night and an afternoon of Token Con, do recording, and I can do some rush editing before the final day where we do our award show presentation and final closing ceremonies for Token Con here in Oklahoma City. Da, 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 da. So if you're in Oklahoma City, make sure to come to Token Con. You're going to find us there pretty much the whole time. Make sure to come say hi, and we will gladly high-five you, give you a hug, stand there awkwardly, whatever you desire. I mean, I'd play a game, too. Yeah, we should probably play games there. That's the most important part. Belt will just stand there awkwardly while you and I play a game. How's that? Yes. Belt that, just starts rocking. That's and... so accurate. <laughs> I'll make sure not to ask you to get a board game from back <laughs> in the back of the store. I think that covers everything, so thank you again, and until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. See you Bye. Bye.